So we're gathered here today with some of the group on this nice wet in North Dakota, Wednesday. Lots of good rain <laughs> for the flowers and crops and vegetables and trees. My tree outside my window is just green. But anyway, uh, so I'm here with Paige, with Witty, and with Vic. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start. And Vic said he had some questions. So we're going to go with his questions. Lead on. With them. All right. Go ahead, Vic. So this is a bit of a hot button issue a few years ago, and it keeps coming up in our society over and over because we live up here in the United States. I guess it's big in Africa as well. But I want to get the circle's thoughts or even the history behind male circumcision and how that cut on. And uh, yeah, I'll just preface and say I used to be pro-circumcision and now I'm anti-circumcision so yeah that is my question what what happened here steve will take that one Ooh. i want you to know that when i get below they better damn well not circumcise me <laughs> mm. because i'm totally opposed good because the way the penis grows <laughs> is the way god knows <laughs> how to do it you see and i don't think anybody should be fooling around with some baby's wee wee and so i want to say that that's how i feel today now i have to say that I didn't always have such a high flutin idea about it because I did not play that way in my life recently. And I've come to see that it's kind of a ancient trust. Oh, great. On the Anunnaki. You ask me why I say that. And I say it because <laughs> I'm making Stephanie blush with my question. It's a successful day. <laughs> I'm really going to say that. You got to <laughs> say it. You're blushing big time. He had the biggest cob you ever did see. <laughs> and it started a tradition where people would say, I wonder how they got that way. <laughs> and mm. They would try to come up with a solution. And they said, well, maybe it's this covering that is covering it all up. <laughs> if we cut it off, it would let it grow, <laughs> you see. Because they didn't trust on their own biology. Is this true, Steve, or are you just feeding us a lie? All I can say is that they did play in a pretty dramatic way because they didn't take any <laughs> wooden nickels, you see, when they would Ooh, Stephanie's cheeks grew three times redder this day. <laughs> we should have somebody else than Steve. Steve has a way of doing things like that and saying things mm. that he knows will make me blush. Okay. <clears throat> somebody else have anything to say about this? Because I don't think I want to repeat what Steve says. 
<laughs> Tobias says, well, Steve does have a point still. <laughs> Even though his point is kind of blunt these days because they're gonna be they're gonna have all kinds of jokes and puns, guys. I can't. I don't think I can do it this one. You can do it. I believe in you. There was an old tradition, honey, from the days of yore, and that your foreskin was the sin that made you have to be half a man, you see, because they believe that it was the price they had to pay. Oh my God. For having to stay on earth, you see. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get the, the connection. Do you get the connection, Vic? I between I, the Anunnaki, the chosen I, ones, and the removal of the foreskin? I'm not sure I do. <laughs> um is it Almost like idea. a torture ritual? Which, no, which group removed the foreskin? Well, traditionally the Jews, but I think the Egyptians did it before that. Did the Egyptians do it? Be no. <laughs> no? Oh, they no. do it now. The Egyptians did not do it. It was strictly from the chosen people. And the chosen people, as you know, were the Anunnaki. And as you know, they reincarnated back in the day. And they said, we're the chosen ones today. <laughs> and because we have to live in these bodies with this foreskin, you see, which is not the way that we're used to play, then we have to get rid of it because it represents the... sins of our fathers and the sins of our fathers were to create the humans you see because they still had this deep consciousness of the time when the Anunnaki came to earth and created the human race so not everybody knows this story of course so if you want to know the whole story, buy the book Sewn Together, which we dictated in conjunction with Steph, because she had to type it all up, you see, and put it on the shelves for others to see. But what you need to know is that the Anunnaki died, at least some of them did in the end of the story and they came back into human bodies which was not exactly a treat for them because they did realize that the feat that they accomplished when they created the human DNA became the way they had to play so the masters became the slaves you might say but they had an ancient memory because the souls remember their history. And in those days, there was actually more capacity to remember your history because things were still kind of new on earth and we hadn't blew as many lifetimes away in a traumatic way where we began to block our memories, you see. So people could still remember, and they began to say, well, the reason we're trapped in these stupid bodies is because we didn't play the way that our ancestors told us to play. Mm. They told us to never interfere 
with the life forms in the universe, you see, but to let them be and live in their own trajectory because our ancestors, of course, were from Nibiru and they knew that they blew their own chances to survive on their own planet because they didn't trust on the natural processes of life, you see. And so they left a legacy for their descendants that said, thou shalt never access any interference in the lives of others that God did decree should live in their own company. And the idea that came from you know who, we won't say his name here, to create the human race was through the grace of God, you see, because of course God was trying to overcome his inability to get the upgraded DNA into the earth vibration because they kept petering out. Every time that there would be a trust on a new branch of the great ape or some other animal that was akin thereto, they would lose their vitality and they would all die away because it just takes a while before things begin to come together in a harmonious way. And so you might say that this fellow did humanity a good turn by creating humanity, but in the process he had to defy that ancient prohibition, you see. So it would be like someone committing a mortal sin on earth and trusting that they'll go to hell, you see. And so when he ended up dying at the end of the story that we told in So On Together, he came to see that his ability to continue to be Anunnaki was done. And so he had to come back in the body of one of the so-called animals or be suburban that he himself had created because he was the head of the project, you see. And it was his brainstorm to do so. It's his idea. And so, as you know, he's not doing too well today because he's had a lot of bad lives because he could never forget that he had to be so stupid, you see, because the Anunnaki were very brilliant and technologically advanced by the interpretations we would have today of how people do play. They were very smart. And then he found himself in a body that wasn't that smart and the brain just wouldn't function the way he wanted to. And the fingers were clumsy and he couldn't handle delicate instrumentation. And so he was in despair. Eventually, the Anunnaki came back in a group to say, hey, we're the chosen people. Because we were the ones that were chosen to leave Nibiru in the spaceship, you see. So they still had that history. And they remembered that they had to be the chosen people, you see. And they said, well, how will we know who the chosen people are? What if someone else tries to infiltrate our group, you see? And so they decided to mark each of the children in a way that would say, these are our children. These are members of our group. And they will always be that way. 
and nobody else has to know about it. But if we're ever in doubt, we can check it out. And so they began the tradition of circumcision, you see, because they figured it wouldn't leave a permanent scar or cause any real harm to the individual, you see. Might be a little tricky in the way that they would make the incision and cut off the skin, but it wouldn't cause a lot of bleeding and limited risk to the individual. And so that's the way they did play. And you can take what Steve did say with a grain of salt because he is not the best one to know who has a lot to show. So Steve, go sit down and we will get on with the discussion. Any other questions about that? No, I think that pretty much handles it. So is it kind of like an original sin in the beginning and then kind of morphed into a an in-group indicator where they're like, oh, we know, we know who's chosen. Because that's really the biblical narrative is it, it was created to set the Jews apart from others. Well, both, both. Okay. Because the foreskin was not something that was known to the Anunnaki. They had a different anatomy. Got it. And so it was both, you might say. So it served both the purpose of saying, well, we're in these human bodies today, and that's the price we paid for our sin. Not necessarily that it was only that part of the anatomy, because they had other parts of the anatomy that were different too. But it was just like, we have to pay for the sin for being in these bodies. But we're going to do the best we can with what we got. And we have to know a lot about our friends you see because we don't want the wrong people in our group because they still trusted on being the chosen people they still trusted on their history as the anunnaki now for others to understand there was a lot of hatred towards the anunnaki and in the early days when people still had a memory from their soul history if they knew somebody had been the anunnaki they would blow them away because that's what the Anunnaki did in their day. They would blow the humans away if they didn't do what they would say. So the Anunnaki became the chosen people in the beginning. The tradition, of course, encompasses many people with different soul histories today. But in the beginning, it was a way for them to say, we just need to play in our own way, people. And stay away from those other humans. And they did, actually. They had secret hideouts, you might say, where they would play in their own way. And because they had a very intelligent soul identity, they could often create places that were rather advanced, you see. And then once the Elohim mixed the DNA with the other humans and they got more dexterity and you might say bigger brains. They then could engage in a lot of technological development. So a lot of the people who are very technologically astute are actually Anunnaki in their soul energy. I'm not going to say that the Anunnaki were a large proportion of humanity, because they're not. They're just not. The vast proportion of the soul energy in humanity derives from the experimentation in crossbreeding, you might say that resulted in the human DNA. So the vast bulk derived their 
human history from the time that they were created in the earth energy, which was nearly 300,000 years ago. But the souls who derived from the ancient history of Nibiru, although a small proportion of the totality, are the ones who ended up with a lot to say about what happened that day because, of course, the Anunnaki were the ones who controlled the whole shebang and the Elohim were the ones who were basically the brains of the outfit among the humans. And the other humans were the laborers, you see. And, of course, once the human DNA was fully spread, everything one has about the same amount of brain cells and physical development, although there's variations, of course. But the ability to handle a needle and thread and a test tube is about the same for everyone on Earth today. And the ability to learn, to use language, to think through complex problems is about the same as well. The only difference is in the soul history that some have more experience than others, you might say. Does this long answer satisfy your need to know? It satisfies yes. my brain. Um, so this isn't a question, but just a thought. So there's one specific group who may or may not be Anunnaki descendants that consistently uh, wins the Nobel Prize uh, over and over and over. So, I mean, that would definitely help explain it. A specific group that does? Yes, uh, Jews. <laughs> oh, Jews do? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. I don't know if they knew that either. You guys know that? No? Thanks for informing us, Vic. Oh, yeah. Because I'd say you can make it stick. Because it's pretty thick around here and everybody's going, did you know that? Did you know that? <laughs> Those mm. damn Jews. They Be careful. Have this is YouTube. The ability <laughs> to incorporate their soul history into the human DNA in a way that others can't play. <laughs> <laughs> the um there was there was also a podcast I was listening to and um one theorist who was Jewish was theorizing that all of the rote memorization of the Hebrew scriptures that Jews partake in is sort of like um a trial to see how much their brains can handle of retaining that information. And then each generation is getting more and more able to um, remember more and, and focus more. So that well, might have something. I'm, there I'm might getting be some... a no. We, no. we don't, we don't, we don't agree with that. Oh, okay. We think that would not be correct. However, they would probably just end up with, Stagnant brains from all that brain drain. But their capacity for understanding deeper ideas and principles of technology and science is more developed because of their soul energy. Mm. So, of course, there are many Jews today whose soul energy does not include the Anunnaki, but there are enough of them that gravitate into that particular group because they recognize each other. Yeah. And so souls have a certain amount of flexibility where they will reincarnate, you see, so they can get variety of experiences. But they do like to hang out with their buddies, you might say. Just like we do today. Yep. That's very okay. interesting. I didn't know that. It's fun to get these little pearls. Oh, yes. Anyone else have a question now that I've kind of taken up a whole 30 minutes? No, you do. Sure. 
Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, Steph, you know the prayer? Well, I call it a prayer because that's how it felt to me that you did when, when you were looking for answers for your toothache. I don't remember the exact prayer. I, I My memory is just like, I'm just always here, so I don't remember what happened yesterday. Looking for answers for your toothache. And I think Steve gave that to you. Oh, I, I think it's like, God help me to help you. How can I help you to help me to figure something out? <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, it gave me so much joy. I wrote it down and it's my prayer now. So anyway, I, I just wanted to say, I'm so grateful for that. But Thank my you. question is, I don't know if Jesus will show up today. So I've heard Jesus say he's just an ordinary person like us. So my question is, how did Jesus get to be the Jesus? He must have done something that took him apart from us. What did he do? Well, Jesus is a part of the group from Hebrew. Jesus was Elohim. So from the beginning, they were the group that were in charge of the other humans, you see. So they always felt a lot of responsibility for using their ancient history and experience to help the other humans, you see. So they had a good relationship with God. The Elohim did from the beginning. They had developed that back on Nibiru. So they were, you might say, a small sect on Nibiru that stayed together after the planet was destroyed because they had a good relationship with each other. They were a soul family. And so they migrated through many different planets where they would reincarnate in difficult circumstances until they were granted the opportunity to reincarnate on earth, you see, through the, we'll call it beneficence, although they didn't think of it always in those terms, of the Anunnaki. This soul group is very, very ancient. It includes Jesus, includes Steve, includes Stephanie, and it includes many others who have an ancient history of being able to penetrate through the animosity of humanity to understand the core reality, you see. So while the Anunnaki were very technologically advanced, the Elohim, although they were quite capable of high intellectual pursuits, were the ones who were more philo philosophical, you might say. And they often had They often had lifetimes where they were renowned for being thought leaders, you might say. Hey, thank you. Yes. However, this is not to say that there isn't anybody else today, no matter what your soul history, that couldn't play a similar part to Jesus. But do you really want to be crucified today? No, I don't want the part of so most people are unwilling to play that part. Not the part of crucifixion, but oops. Oh yeah. Not the part of crucifixion, but the part of um I think loving and trusting God completely. Say that again, Winnie. I didn't quite catch that. I, I kept on telling myself that Jesus is the way he is because he loved and trusted God completely. At least that was my own intellectual understanding. So um, Yes, that is true. However, you have to understand that Jesus has had many other lifetimes as well. And not all of them ended up in him being the only son of God. In fact, none of them did because it's only one son of God, <laughs> according to the religious point of view. Uh, 
I'm trying to look for a quicker and shorter way to get closer to God, trusting him 100%. What was the line before 100%? Trusting God 100%. You're seeing that 100%? No, I said I'm trying to look for a shorter and quicker way to trust, to love and trust God 100%. Okay. Okay. Um, a I simple way. Well, let me ask you this, and this is Jesus. I'm here today. What would you prefer to trust on? What else is there? What are your choices? I have none. Well, then, <laughs> if you got no other choices, the needle points to trust God 100%. Well, all habits. All teaching, the two plus two equals five. I'm trying to get that off my head. It's not coming up too quickly, too easily. Just remember this. When you sit out on the deck in front of your house or wherever, on the grass or on the beach, and you feel the wind in your hair, do you trust on the wind? Yes, I do. You trust 100% on the wind? Yes, I do. <laughs> Can you capture the wind in a bottle and take it home? No. Well, think of God the same way. You're here today, and in a moment, it won't be exactly the same moment. It'll go away. And so, can you trust that you're here in this moment? Can you trust that in the next moment? Whatever was here in this moment won't be here anymore. Then that's all you need to trust on. And then you trust on God, you see. You don't have to label it. You just say, I trust on reality. I trust on reality that today the wind is in my hair. And maybe in an hour I won't feel any wind. But I know that something blew through my hair and I know it's still there. I know the air is still there and I may not be able to see it, but without it, I wouldn't be here. I need that air, you see, to breathe. I need God energy to believe that I am here because if I didn't have the ability to believe anything, and how would I come to believe that I exist? This is the quandary that humanity does face because they say, I gotta see your face in order to believe in you. I don't believe in the wind today. I don't know what made my hair move, but it sure wasn't the wind. I guess it must have been because I am so powerful I can make my hair move when I don't even think about it. I'm just sitting here and I had a thought yesterday that my hair should move, so I manifested my hair moving today. How crazy is that? How crazy is it to think that you have enough control to manifest your world the way you want it to be. Because it's going to defy you, you see. Your world is going to defy you if you think you're God. You are a part of God. Energy, and you are the child of God, and you can't escape it no matter how hard you try. You can't tell the wind when to blow. but you know it when it blows past you. What else can you trust? What else do you trust? Do you really trust anything else 
And the fact that you're here and you're alive and you can hear, you can see, you can think, you can do all these things. If you can trust on that, you're trusting on God, you see. So stop trying to put God in a bottle and say, hey, I got God in this bottle today. And this is what God looks like. God looks like the shape of the bottle that I found out there in the dump and I picked it up and I stuffed God into it. And now everybody look at this. This is what God looks like. If your God doesn't look like this, then you got the wrong God. You don't really have God, you see. How stupid is that? Better to say, look at me, see me. This is the shape of God today. This is what God looks like today. Tomorrow, God may look a little bit different because maybe I'll style my hair a different way. <laughs> look at that tree. That's the shape of God today. Look at this computer. What do you think of that one? That's the shape of God today. Which reminds me. Steve has something to say. And he wants to say to you, because he wants you to understand this today, that he didn't make the iPhone. He only dreamed it, you see. Who made it? Huh? God? I can't hear you at all. You're on. Steph, I just saw something here. Can I go out and try to fix this thing? They said I can go to setting and fix my audio. Did you say God made it? Yes, that's what I was saying. Well, others would say differently. They would say there was a whole lot of very smart people that figured out how to create that iPhone. And I just dreamed it up and I just sold them. Because I wanted you to have one in your pocket, you see. And so God works through you and me in different ways, you see, is what a point I'm trying to make. It's a team effort. Life is a team effort. <laughs> God is a team effort. Does this make sense to you? If you say God made it, what did God look like? I see. He looked like a lot of people. You could probably look up their pictures <laughs> on the internet and say which ones contributed to the iPhone today. What I'm trying to say is you'll never pin God down. You'll never get God stuffed in that bottle and say, oh, you're the one that made the iPhone. And God will say, oh, my God, you think I'm the creator of the iPhone today? Well, only part of me, honey, only part of me. And another part of it was you. Because it wouldn't exist today for you if you hadn't seen one or heard of one in some way, you see. So you're a part of the play. You're a part of the story. Some say that's God's job to tell stories. It's God's job to be the story. It's God's job to be here today in every person in every way and to say, I love you because I am a part of you. And I am also the one that made you, because who else do you think made you? How many times have you seen a photon? What's your pet electron? Did you name it? Do you have it on a leash? You know God, you might say, by his effects. You know the wind by its effects. So you look at the iPhone and you say, 
Well, I know there's a God because I have an iPhone today. I know there's a God because I have eyes to see. I know there's a God because there's air that I can breathe. I know there's a God because everything tells me that today. Everything fits together in the most miraculous way that I couldn't do if you told me to. I couldn't tell you how to make that wind blow through my hair. I can't tell you how to create the air you breathe. But it's there, it's there. And so beware of trying to define God and just say to your friend, I love you today. And then you know that God can hear you. And eventually you'll come to see that you can talk to God in a way like Stephanie, because she doesn't care to put God in a bottle, you see. She just says, hey, God, I'm here because it's fun to play with you. It's fun to play the game of being a child of God, you see. And that's one of God's favorite games to play because he plays it with you. There is no end of what God can do. And if God wants to talk to you, he can do that. Why not? Are we getting the message through to all of you? Please let us know because we can come at it a different way if this doesn't make sense to you. Makes good sense. Paige, did you have a question? Sure. Um, it's, um, so I was thinking about Jesus histories and I was wondering if um, after Jesus played the role of Jesus, was he ever in a lifetime where he ha he was raised in a, a religion like Christian church? And was he did he ever, you know, had to do that type of thing? Yes. Many times. I imagine Jesus being forced to pray to Jesus. As horrible as it is to laugh at that. Like, you need to pray to Jesus to forgive your sins. He's like, okay. I'm getting a no. What is that about Jesus? Never prayed to Jesus. Because uh, my mother said to me when I was a little boy, you have to be punished, you see, if you continue to make fun of the Catholic Church. <laughs> and I did say, well, I think I need to go away then because I can't stay here listening to this. Or I think I'm going to vomit, you see. That was only one lifetime, of course, but it comes to mind because <laughs> I had a mind of my own, let me tell you. <laughs> However, yes, I had lifetimes when I was forced to pretend to pray to Jesus, which is all anybody tries to do. They just pretend because how can you pray to a symbol, you see? How can you pray to a golden idol? How can you pray to a false reality? Now, when you come to me and you say, 
Jesus, pray tell me true. <laughs> what can I do for you? I say, okay, there's somebody who came to me and said to me, how can I help you? So must be because I was praying to them that they would come and release me from the mendacity of humanity. <laughs>